uh, to hide to, that. To hide that. The ride lasted 12 hours before 22 hostages, including the warden, were released. Five people were hospitalized, including two inmates who apparently overdosed with drugs taken from the prison pharmacy. Three agencies looked for the cause of the uprising. Prison Commissioner Fred Smith. We have found that there was a lack of communication between our social services staff and our security staff, and a lack of communications between those two groups and our inmates concerning their grievance procedures. In addition to that, there's the variable of a, an escape attempt uh, by some inmates or a plan that we've discovered that helped initiate it. Uh, since that time, there's been 22 indictments handed down, and there will possibly be some uh, internal disciplinary procedures on some employees. Commissioner Smith says a new grievance form is now used to speed up attention to inmates' complaints in an effort to prevent another uprising like the one at St. Clair. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News reporting. An Alabama Supreme Court justice, a circuit judge, and local attorneys explained our court system to this diverse group of 15 to 23-year-olds, including our law ensuring a person's innocent until proven guilty. Now that is a heavy burden of proof. That's a heavy responsibility. And that is something that separates the American system of criminal justice from a lot of other countries. After hearing about the U.S. justice system, the young man took a tour of the Montgomery County Jail to see what happens to the violators of our system's laws. The youths voiced a variety of comments on their visit to the U.S., including one Pakistani who misses home cooking. They cook all food and eat with spices and all those things. They only boil and they're tasteless. Another youth from South Africa gave social commentary on his country's current unrest. If you take it uh, South African at the moment, and you take America a few years back, it's almost the same. We have the problems now which America had of a lot of years ago. While in Montgomery, the youths will visit a nearby ranch and learn how to rope cattle, which their guide says should be an interesting experience since some of these boys have never seen a cow, while others regard them as sacred animals. Lisa Walsh, WSFA TV News. <laughs> physician on his regular rounds was in the hospital would come into the morgue and say like at night
What we're asking is for death investigation as far as the medical certification to be done by a physician rather than layman, as done now by coroner. Coroner would still go out, get all the information, medical history, so forth, but a physician would have to examine the body and decide on the cause of death. Or set up under the Florida Medical Examiner System, which is one thing I looked at. I don't know if I've got it. 36% was in Dothan, 27 in the county, and 37% in the hospital. So far in 85. The removal of an old building. Uh, draw up x-ray. We're going to propose, number one, change the corner from electric to the... I think we're probably going to keep that, and of course we're going into a rotating schedule where we'll be playing five. <laughs> <laughs> well, we plan to play baseball at Auburn next spring, and uh, so I don't know. Quarterback situation is is great as far as I'm concerned because I feel like we got three guys that could handle a quarterback situation. Uh, Pat Washington, Jeff Berger, and Bobby Walden all have ability and talent. They've all shown the moments of greatness or outstanding. Uh, I wouldn't say that any of them have have shown that they are consistent uh, consistent enough to say that this is the number one guy and this is who we're going to live or die with. Right now, the thing is, is up in the air. We're going to bring them back in the fall, go through fall practice and preparation, all the scrimmages, keep notes on them. First two ball games, probably play all three of them, and then settle on a starter and get the starter ready for the Tennessee game. We got that extra week in there to, to where we can settle on who we're going to fight the war with. We're going to fight a couple of battles with all three of them and then, and then make that decision. So what I hope will happen is that these guys are going to settle the issue on the field, on the battlefield, that it won't be done in the courtroom. So if we can get that done, then uh, we'll have, a, as far as I'm concerned, the per perfect solution to everybody's question about who the quarterback is going to be. Looking at our situation as far as our personnel is concerned not only the fact that we got great tailback prospects but our quarterbacks offensive line tight ends receivers being able to utilize our personnel to the fullest we felt like that we could we could do it uh, better from our formation we feel like it will make us more versatile uh, and in every respect so we made a decision to move from the I formation. I'm not saying that someday we may not go back to the wishbone, uh, but I think right now with the, the potential that we have at quarterback and, and the other skill positions that uh, and the offensive line, that the I formation is a is a more suitable to to what we want to accomplish as an offensive football team. Uh, I think Kerry Good is coming along extremely well. He's had no problems whatsoever, swelling or pain with the knee in his rehabilitation. He's worked extremely hard, uh, <clears throat> and he's there working, has been all summer. He's still about 90 to 92 percent. He feels like in his own mind. I don't think he'll ever get past 95 before we play Georgia. But a 95 percent Kerry Good is not half bad. Uh, <laughs> in a room uh, not as about half as big as this one <clears throat> and there wasn't you know the other side just put his ear to the wall and listen uh, uh, it was cooked speaking of the food the soup having soup was real fortunate for us because soup was always boiled if you live in a tropical backward country like that <clears throat> you want your water to be boiled and your food to be cooked uh, I can say one thing for the communists, they had good control over their people, and they told them to boil the water, and they boiled the water. And uh, they boiled the water for themselves, and they boiled the water for us, and we'd never made it if it hadn't been for things like, a few things like that.
Some of these people have previous arrest uh, trafficking in drugs. And the instance that Captain Stokes related, just the problems that we face in law enforcement, is that uh, these people are, are caught, they're tried, they're sentenced, they're back on the street either on bond or some type of release. Governor Wallace has just ended his second full day of preliminary test at Craig Hospital in suburban Denver. Today, the test centered on his neurophysiological condition, or how much information is moving through his spinal cord. This morning, Craig Hospital case. Medical Director uh, Daniel Lambert says nothing in the test uh, so far show any reason why the governor tomorrow, shouldn't be a good candidate for this surgery. We are still in the process of doing our preliminary evaluations. We've operated on quite a few other patients that are at his age and have his medical uh, situation without major problems. There haven't been any photo opportunities for the media with the governor since he was admitted Sunday, but Press Secretary Billy Joe Camp says the promise of a possibly pain-free life is helping the governor endure the pain he suffers even today. He was not complaining of that pain this morning, and uh, he looked well and uh, was conversing with uh, the staff people and both his staff and the hospital staff. But Camp says the rigors of day-long tests leave the governor, like any patient, a little fussy at the end of the day. Even so, the job of running state government goes on. This afternoon, Executive Secretary Elvin Stanton flew in from Montgomery with paperwork for the governor to take care of. Along with Stanton was Dr. Hamilton Hutchinson, the governor's personal physician. He's here to watch the operation firsthand so he'll have a better knowledge of it when Governor Wallace returns to Montgomery in several weeks. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News, Denver, Colorado. About 70 state Republicans who helped re-elect President Reagan at the county level have been asked to do the same for local candidates in 1986. And they're being trained by members of the Republican National Committee on how to turn around Alabama's traditionally Democratic voting record. And that's one of the things I want to do with all of you today is help you find ways to better communicate with the media in your counties and to increase the visibility that your county organization has. The Republicans have a plan. They realize they can't expect a massive switch from the Democratic to the Republican Party throughout the state. Instead, they're targeting districts where large numbers of Republicans are registered. We're going to fish where the fish are biting. Montgomery County, for example, Houston County, Dale. Uh, Lee County, where we have extremely strong uh, local Republican uh, vote. State Republicans say they are not riding off the gubernatorial race, but admit having a Republican in the governor's mansion is not their number one priority. Instead, they are devoting their energies to re-electing Senator Jeremiah Denton and doubling their numbers in the state legislature. Lisa Walsh, WSFA TV News. Steve, how about uh, grabbing that out? Let's see if we can just roll a wheelbarrow in there. Safe screws, though. Safe screws. Safe screws. Safe One hundred and forty-two kids assembled this morning at the Fraser Memorial United Methodist Church. They separated into groups, loaded their tools and supplies, and headed out into Montgomery. This group stopped at this home on Dickerson Street to do some work. It's our big work project for the summer, and we have all the youth going to, to different, we get the houses from uh, Montgomery Council on Aging. 
and they go to about 30, 35 houses and do general yard work, uh, carpentry work, and painting. And it's a great time for our youth to, to see what service is all about, and that's, that's really what the purpose of the project is, to teach our kids to serve, and it also helps the community out. The materials to fix up the homes are provided by the church at no cost to the homeowners. The labor provided by the kids is also free. What the kids get in return is a very valuable lesson. These people that we're helping cannot help themselves, so we have to go out and we're covering things like the welfare and stuff like that cannot handle. It makes me feel real good because like, they'll tell you that, that you're the best people that, you, that they've ever known and that they love you very much and stuff and it feels real good. By the end of the week, about 35 homes will get some help and some new friends. Craig Meadows, WSFA TV News. We're making no assumptions about capital appreciation. You are not. We are not. Not in this, not in this number. Purchase agreement's an uh, insignificant amount. The rationale, the highest credit risk or high, lowest credit risk in the world, probably represented by U.S. Treasuries and agencies. And they give an historic sense to take that up to the full 25 if and when they return to normal uh, differentials. Certificates of deposit, 5%. That's when yields are attractive versus Treasury bills, which is basically the other short term area. And we would have roughly 10% of the in short terms at the moment. Repurchase agreements, uh, as I said before, a fairly insignificant amount. They're good for, for parking money overnight but that has a problem of, of income volatility, a dramatic income volatility, because the rate changes day. Peanuts have been and continue to be one of the reasons agriculture is Alabama's leading industry. Peanut farmers across the state feel this year's program puts growers and manufacturers in a better position than four years ago when the 81 Farm Bill was up for consideration. According to Alabama's Peanut Producers Association president, without Senator Heflin's peanut program, state farmers won't be able to compete in foreign markets. We cannot compete in world prices with the 10 cents a day labor, with the type of labor we are having to pay in the inputs in machinery and chemicals and all to give the wholesome product that we uh, put on the market today. We have the most wholesome peanuts that there is in the world. The House and Senate committees have already approved the program and Mobley believes the bill will pass when it reaches the floor for a vote. And we hope this will be in the next uh, few days or maybe a few weeks that it will go to the floor and come out. We look for a favorable report out of the House and the, and the uh, Senate. Supporters of the program are hopeful the Farm Bill will come up for a vote next week before the August recess. Scott Edcock, WSFA TV News, Dothan. The weapons end up here in the police property room. They range from sawed off shotguns to revolvers. Some of the weapons are stored here until they are needed during trials for murder, manslaughter, or illegal possession. Major John Wilson is the spokesman for the police department. The biggest story about them, Norman, is we can't get rid of them. We usually get somewhere around 350 weapons a year. What you see behind us here in the box is about 150 that we're trying to get rid of, and we've got probably twice that many waiting to be disposed of. These are all taken off the streets and various crimes from various people, and that gives you some idea of how many people run around the city toting weapons. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News, reporting. Forty-seven-year-old John Ed Matheson is a reigning state racquetball champion in the men's 45 and older classification. In fact, he's been state champion eight out of the last 12 years. He's also won the state tennis tournament five of the last six years. Dr. John Ed Matheson is the minister of Fraser Memorial United Methodist Church here in Montgomery and has been for the last 13 years. The two men are one and the same, which might strike some people as odd. A minister who not only participates in, but excels in athletics. Well, of course, a lot of people have weird ideas of ministers, but we're human beings, and some ministers are good at music, some in athletics, some in art, some in different areas of life, and there's really nothing different about a minister except that he's been called by God 
to a full-time Christian service. I think obviously anybody that exercises and stays in shape will be able to do whatever they do much better with a lot more proficiency. And I think that's just expected of anybody who's going to be a good steward of all that God has given them. And how does the Frazier congregation view their athletic minister? Well, according to Dr. Matheson, no differently from anyone else. I don't think they look upon me as being any different than, you know, the average layman or anybody else. And I think they're extremely proud of any accomplishment that anybody in our church family makes in any endeavor of life. Dr. Matheson has found that participation in athletics has served as an aid to his ministry. Well, I think the Bible tells us well to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And the best place to do that is to get out in the world where people are. And, you know, the Old Testament reminds us we ought to run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Uh, the body is the temple of God. We ought to take care of it just as we would anything else and let our light shine before men. And whether he's on the racquetball court or in the pulpit, Dr. John Ed Matheson practices what he preaches. In Montgomery, Mark Thornhill, WSFA TV Sports. Hey, Bill, in the press area, you told the writers that uh, something to the effect of that you thought it was a bad idea to change the rule in the middle of a season. Can you repeat your comment to that effect? What I said was I hated to see it happen in the middle of the year because you come down here and you're working. It's 4th of July, and, and I see all these guys working hard trying to get back running again. You know, including us, we ain't where we feel like we should be, but still yet, you know, I don't understand it, but I don't guess I understand a lot of things. I believe it's going to hurt. Uh, there's no doubt about that. It's, it seems like on some race cars it's lost a mile, maybe two mile an hour. Uh, we've seen it uh, at Daytona, July 4th. Uh, you know, about a, a two or three mile an hour drop in the speed, and I think we're going to see basically the same thing at Talladega. surgery in a Denver hospital earlier today and the first indications from his doctors are encouraging. Let's go live now to Denver where reporter Chris Grimshaw has been following the governor's story all week. Chris, we understand for the most part things are looking good at this point. Bob, the initial reports from the recovery room say that Governor Wallace is in stable condition and perhaps even more important that the governor has not yet felt any pain from his lower region, his legs and his right side, pain where he has had uh, severe pain for the past 13 years caused by damaged nerve fibers from the 1972 attempted assassination in Laurel, Maryland. In a late afternoon news conference, Dr. Daniel Lamertz, the attending physician for, Dr. Or for Governor Wallace, said that the surgeons in the operating room did not run into any problems directly related to the so-called dorsal root entry or zone procedure. However, the doctors say that the surgeons did find a small cyst in the governor's spinal column at or just below the area of the injury in 1972. They say that that cyst is apparently not related to the 
pain that he has been suffering for the past 13 years. They did not remove the cyst, but they did put a small catheter in, which allows that cyst fluid to drain. They don't expect that cyst to be any problem in the future. And during the operation, they also removed two small bone fragments from the governor's spinal it's column, apparently like left over from the governor's 1972 really. shooting experience. What they I also aren't expected to be related to the pain. The doctor spent nearly five hours this afternoon working through a seven to ten inch incision in the governor's back performing the procedure, which is designed to eliminate those ner damaged nerve fibers, which for 13 years and for no apparent reason have been signaling the brain with pain sensations. Along with me is George Wallace, Jr. I'm sure that the governor, when in the recovery room and uh, when asked about the sensations of pain in his lower legs, whether he had them or not, was perhaps excited that he had, was not feeling anything. He was. He was very pleased. Uh, I was with him uh, in the recovery room shortly after he regained consciousness, and uh, he indicated that uh, he felt no pain in his uh, lower extremities, and that made us uh, obviously very happy. And we will look in the next day or two to see if that holds true for the abdominal area, which we're very hopeful and have reason to be optimistic that that uh, will be the case. How is he looking in the operating room? It was a rather lengthy and major surgery experience. It was. He looked good in recovery. He. Uh, obviously is in some discomfort from the uh, incision, but uh, we got him back into his room and we talked to him. I, I did tell him in the recovery room that the people of Alabama had prayed for him as he had requested, and he asked me to thank them, and I would like to do that at this time because we are convinced that their prayers uh, saw him through this and will see him through the future in terms of enhancing his quality of life. Optimism was very high coming into the operation procedure. I'm sure that for yourself and for First Lady Lisa Wallace, the optimism is even higher now. It really is. We're very excited and uh, uh, we're a very happy family today and, and uh, we'll be even, even happier as, as days go by and he progresses even more and uh, the, the pain diminishes uh, and that will be a, a great, great time for my dad. Any words of uh, promise from the doctors concerning uh, how well this may work? Well, they're very, very optimistic. As you know, the success rate in this type of procedure has been very high. And uh, the initial reaction from uh, the post-operative uh, talking to him and uh, from the technical aspect is, is, is very uh, positive. So we feel very good, Chris, very, very good. Thank you, George, Thank for being you. with us. And our prayers and our best wishes are with you. Thank you, sir. The governor is expected to stay at Craig Hospital in Denver, Colorado, for perhaps the next two weeks convalescing before returning back to Alabama. Bob? Thanks a lot. Chris Grimshaw live at Craig uh, in Denver from uh, Craig Hospital earlier today also. We'll be going back live to Denver again with Chris during our 10 o'clock report. Well, some of those papers Governor Wallace signed yesterday were to remove three... Yes, we've got these in front of us this year somewhere between... West Montgomery, well, 6,000. That's to stay within that target figure, it's 1,000. 553,000 would be based on the 1,900, which gives you an annual projection of approximately going to need something within the next five years. Yeah. Come to basically our library assistants and first typist twos and one cures. And probably the second largest in the first one. First one should give you our part of it, and the second one will give you Give us his total of a million. Of us uh, thought about him for a few minutes and, and certainly wished him well that he'd get relief from the pain that he ought to be here, discuss it, find out what's going on, and then make appropriate decisions. Now, there have been some. Those who are in the range of 65 to 70 may very well get enough help to pass. Those people who test scores are in the range of 50 to 60 are almost certain. Well, it's, it's, the decree has already been composed even though it is not finalized. We still member of the board Governor The board Wallace was under a federal court order to come up with right a new now. formula today and with barely a quorum present it narrowly passed a complicated formula which bases certification evenly on test scores and grade point averages a statistician who helped devise the mathematical equation says the majority of the plaintiffs who failed the test will not be certified with the new plan in general, those people whose test scores are in the range of 65 to 70 may very well get enough help to pass. Those people whose test scores are in the range of 50 to 60 are almost certainly not going to get enough help to pass. 
Board members Evelyn Pratt and Nolan Williams voted against the formula because they say they don't want the public to feel they are in favor of the settlement. But board member Isabel Thomason says today's vote couldn't be construed that way. And there is no question this board never voted for this settlement. The board also voted today to ask federal judge Myron Thompson to reconsider his decision on the settlement. They've already stated they plan to appeal. Plaintiffs will have a hearing on September 3rd to voice any objections to the new formula approved today. Lisa Walsh, WSFA TV News. I, uh, who was there with us at the meeting, uh, chemical wording. Uh, of those two incinerator ships, Volcanus 1 and Volcanus 2. I think chemical waste management, um, of course, any further statement, chemical waste management here in Alabama, uh, Georgia. As chairman of the committee, I'd like to express my appreciation Chemical waste management is ending a three-year battle with the state and its residents over the loading, storing, and burning of hazardous waste in Alabama. The company had wanted to operate a loading facility and base the Volcanus 1 and 2 at the port of Chickasaw. But public outcry and the potential for a hazardous waste spill led to public hearings, court injunctions, and finally today's surrender. Dothan Representative Joe Carruthers made the announcement today. Waste Management Incorporated will no longer pursue using the Port of Chickasaw and Mobile Bay as an outlet to the Gulf of Mexico. Carruthers and other members of the legislature's Hazardous Waste Oversight Committee spent Monday and Tuesday in Chicago with Kim Waste officials hammering out the agreement. In return for Kim Waste's surrender, the state promised to listen to any future company offers to move the ocean incineration projects inland. If you can burn them up and destroy them, then you don't have to go out there and put them down in some hole in the ground and be worried about them coming back to haunt you. Today, there's only one way to absolutely destroy it, and that's to burn it. Dean Argo, WSFA TV News. The vehicle was discovered to have two pounds of cocaine hidden in the door panels during a drug raid at Fort Payne, Alabama, several months ago. The car had been driven from Miami by Diaz and Frontella. Chief Assistant District Attorney Ellen Brooks says cash and other property is involved in these hearings. We are in the process of condemning many vehicles and monies that are used in drug transactions. Recently, we were successful in getting over $1,000 in the Samuel Williams case that he was using in drug deals. We have right now pending uh, an action to get a 1985 Datsun vehicle in the John McBride case. He's already been convicted of trafficking in drugs. Law enforcement agencies have been awarded items ranging from pickups, vans, motorcycles, and aircraft used in transportation of narcotics. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News at the Montgomery County Courthouse. And in view of the remaining seven Americans who are being held in Lebanon, how would you follow up on that situation today? How should we go about getting to the people who are responsible for, for that hostage situation? Well, Bob, you, you picked up on a, a contemporary issue of, of tremendous importance, the House Senate Conference on Armed Services, which I've been participating in for the last uh, 10 days and nights or so. Uh, is amazingly aware of the terrorism problem. We're looking at special operating forces being enhanced. To answer your question specifically about how we would get at those who hold those hostages is rather difficult because we don't know precisely who holds them, where they are. But I am in favor of a, a united government effort uh, to uh, look at terrorism belatedly, learn what it means, uh, develop uh, a set of uh, realistic uh, policies respecting it and then follow through on those policies with commitments.
for adult education or for television. And they worked with this particular document, sent it in. We sent this to you. If you have questions on this, perhaps the person to contact on our staff would be Gerald Kiss for the program coordination. Strategically, we're going to, I think we have the resources. It's just a matter of getting ready to teach the adults, both in terms of the, the, the techniques and in terms of the kinds of programs that they are going to need to be taught. You know. Literacy programs are valuable, and that's one of our great needs. Not necessarily through their own library, possibly, but another library to give some evidence and, and do some planning. Actually see what's out there in terms of support for your own programs. Introduce to go to some differential system of costing this out that the student that majors in accounting should have to pay for it because the rewards are going to be great when he gets out. And you know, I These are members of Dothan's biracial study group. Since the early 70s, black and white members have been meeting to work for United Dothan. Usually these meetings are held behind closed doors. But today the press was invited to hear group members question the candidates. What is your position on hiring black department heads that are qualified? I think we're going to have to do a little special effort to, to get the best people, give all our people opportunity. We were always uh, wanting people that were qualified, that live in Dothan, Alabama, to uh, come and apply for jobs. Another issue discussed was the lack of a public transportation system in the Circle City. If elected, what do you plan to do about the transit system in the city of Dothan? Right now, there is federal money for a private business person to go in the bus business. One of my main concerns is transit in Dothan, and I'll work my heart out trying to see that it is a feasibility and that we can have it. And both mayoral candidates pledged to study the feasibility of public transportation if elected. Cal Cowboy, WSFA TV News, Dothan. I would like to now turn this part of the program over to two. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Captain. You. Let me say on behalf of the LAMP program and public it. Of the faculty and staff and parents, but most importantly, Madeline, the students, I want to thank you and the league for your... Oh, certainly. <laughs> I want to publicly express that one of our newer members, uh, it's excellent that, that we are able to... He had a crash land on a strip that belonged to the North Vietnamese, and uh, with a lot of our Heavenly Father's help, I guess you can say, is we went in and uh, I went in and was successful. I went off the runway, of course, and the runway was too short. I damaged the airplane, and but we were able to get in and get out and get him out of there. Colonel Fisher and the three other Medal of Honor recipients were here at Maxwell to talk to the base's squadron officer school. These men have not only seen combat, but have also unselfishly risked their lives for their country and fellow servicemen, qualities that make true leaders. I was called upon to attempt a rescue of uh, people who had been surrounded all day, and in three different lifts uh, over a period of two and a half hours, which required at least 15 entries and exits into the battle area, why uh, my crew and I evacuated 29 wounded soldiers. I think it's just a need to, you see a problem and you, you have to anticipate what to do and press on and do it. Uh, gain, you know, leaning on all of the reflexes you've got or the experience you've had and uh, hope it works out. And it, it was successful in my case and so I'm real grateful for that. Craig Meadows, WSFA TV News.
downstairs with uh, Nancy Davis. Dick is here too. Governor, that little lady's helped us. felt like that was it, you know, to break up the time that we made up was virtually, I felt like, impossible. But the way the circumstances of the race went, enough, the cars got strung out, and then Earnhardt and some other cars fell out, left Kale running by himself, and that just helped me. of the board, etc., was a little bit less well-defined and discreet. In other words, it was probably over a slightly longer area of his final. It would be uh, prudent to include the five levels rather than his left. They were two small little children. T12. Inches, how much of the spine was treated with? You want to give them a rough estimate of that? Five to six. Five to six yes. I don't, don't hold. Final finding at the surgery, he was found to have a... Significant. Not really. What I was describing yesterday was the one at and one below. Add them up and there's four levels. So he had a five level. Are you talking then about the... ...from the recovery room where we examined Dr. Wallace and had an opportunity to talk to him. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, he, his condition is stable and that uh, initial, his initial report is that he has experienced relief of pain in his legs. Um, he will be coming back to Craig Hospital later this afternoon. Uh, there was an incidental finding at the surgery. He was found to have a small uh, cyst in his spinal cord. This was suspected on the basis of his magnetic resonance image scan that was performed on Monday and was confirmed at operation today with the use of intraoperative ultrasound. Dr. Edgar placed a small shunt catheter into this cyst. I do not feel that this was related to his uh, pain but is more of what we would consider an incidental finding. As we said earlier, Governor Wallace is back in his Denver hospital room tonight. Reporter Chris Grimshaw is live in Denver at this time, and Chris has an update now on Governor Wallace's condition. Chris? Lynn, officials at suburban Denver's Craig Hospital say that Governor Wallace is in stable condition this evening and recuperating fairly well from the lengthy and major surgical operation. The governor's attending physician in Denver, Dr. Daniel Lamberts, told reporters in a news conference just an hour after the operation that Wallace told doctors he wasn't feeling any pain in his legs. That's being interpreted as very, very encouraging. say that it's too early today to, to say that this has been a success. I would say that his report in the recovery room is an encouraging first sign that uh, we've, we've done something good for him. 
During the nearly five hours of surgery, doctors made as many as 80 electrical lesions in an approximately six-inch section of his damaged spinal cord, destroying nerve fibers, which without explanation emit signals which his brain reads as severe pain in his paralyzed right hip and legs. During the operation, doctors also found a three-centimeter cyst in his spinal column. I do not feel that this was related to his uh, pain, but is more of what we would consider an incidental finding. The cyst couldn't be removed, but it was catheterized to vent fluid. The phantom pains have grown tremendously in recent months, even as he posed for pictures the night before surgery. Pain shared by his family members as well for 13 years. There was nothing we could do, and he started talking about this procedure weeks ago, and we were very hopeful that, that uh, he would uh, try it if it was safe. and. Uh,